Now, system engineering began with system management, with the problem of how to organise a large team of people to carry out a multifaceted task on schedule and while making sure all the bits fitted together when they came together. Throughout much of this series, we've been concerned with design, making sure that the pieces will fit. But a major project must also be concerned with management, making sure that the right people and the right resources are available at the right time to carry out the necessary uh, tasks effectively and efficiently. It should not come as a, uh, as a surprise to discover that the approaches and techniques uh, we use for designing the system also reappear when we consider the issue of management. The project is as much a system as the product that we produce at the end of it. We also tended to split the project into phases, implying that the design takes place at the beginning and management takes place afterwards, making sure that design is correctly implemented and demonstrated. But that is not true. Both will be important throughout the duration of the project, designed to overcome the problems emerging during development and management in the very earliest stages to ensure that the project will be organised properly from the start. The two activities strongly interact. The key to successfully managing a systems engineering project is to have the organisation, the procedures and the management practices that tie the system engineering processes and project management processes together. From the way a company is organised to the processes that are used to control the activity, you will find that they all reflect the system model being used to understand the product. So look out for that as we look at task breakdown and management organisations. But perhaps we should start at the very beginning and explain how a project gets started, at least if there's an external customer like a government agency or the armed forces. Typically, the customer will issue a request for proposal, uh, generally known as an RFP. Properly, this will be the result of the customer requirement generation phase uh, and will be seeking contractors who will undertake the system design and uh, build the product. RFPs are used when the product requested is not yet fully defined, meaning that a new system design is required. Uh, there are also requests for tenders, RFTs, uh, which will be used when the product or service is well defined. Uh, so that if the European Space Agency wants a new planetary probe, it will issue an RFP. But if it wants somebody to redecorate the office, it will issue an RFT. But if we're building a system, it will be an RFP. Uh, so what will we find within it? The first and rather obvious component is the technical requirement specification. That should have been defined in the previous life cycle phase. This is a legal definition of what is required of an end product. The second item is the proposed legal contract for the job. In theory, if it is a proposed contract, then you can negotiate, but in practice, the customer is always right, so the normal response is simply to accept them. After all, if you quibble with a contract and your competitor says, sure thing, who's going to win? The third component is a statement of work, like everything else often referred to by its acronym. In this case, not S-O-W, but just SOW, as in female pig. It outlines this, the work the customer expects to be doing uh, to create the thing defined in the requirements. If the RFP is for a study or for support work rather than a system development, then a requirement specification is probably not relevant and may not exist. In these cases, only the SAO will exist and with any technical requirements will be included in the SAO. And finally, an RFP will contain instructions for bidders. This outlines things like what the customer expects in the proposal, any constraints on length and when it wants the bids to be delivered. If you're lucky, it may also have an outline of the criteria by which a bid will be made evaluated. I, I, I think perhaps we should emphasise just how important those instructions for bidders are. You know, the slightest slip up and 
the customer's looking down for wicking down and you just give them an excuse. Yes. There is a story, I don't know how apocryphal it is or how much it's been exaggerated, but it's a company bidding to the uh, Department of Defense in Washington and they're based in California. Um, and the usual thing is you have the bid, this one was quite a small bid so it could be carried in a, a, a suitcase. Uh, and the guy charged with delivering it has to fly via Chicago because the airline, everything yeah. goes through the hub of Chicago. And then Chicago gets snowed in. So he phones back to his base and says, I'm stuck in Chicago, I can't get to Washington. So the team, realising there's a problem, telex the um, Department of Defence saying, Mr. S Mr. Smith is yeah. stuck in Chicago. Uh, here is the main essence of our bid and here's the costings of the bid. So basically saying that the bid is, is was prepared and they yeah. didn't take any extra time. And Mr. Smith, great efforts, gets in and delivers the bid half an hour late. The Department of Defence then say the bid that was received is inadequate because it's the Telex bid. Yeah. <laughs> and the bid that was adequate was too late and is dismissed and they don't get the contract. Mm. So um, I think what they were lucky is that they only had a bid in a, in a, in a sort of yeah. in a suitcase thing because that's not normally the case, is it? No, no. If you get, when, uh, when Bristol did the, um, uh, what would become the Envisat bid, I think that there were something like 17 volumes, and I don't mean tiny volumes, I mean thick yeah. folders yeah. Of, of material um, that had to be delivered. I don't know whether it was... Triplicate or du it's four anyway, copies, normally. four copies normally, yeah. uh, and they drove it in a van <laughs> mm. uh, to get there to a um, special site that uh, ESA had, had rented for the purpose mm. of receiving these documents because it was one of mm. a number of things, uh, and were very proud that they could handle all this paperwork. Uh, I knew that they couldn't possibly read their way through all that paperwork and, and make sure everything ticked together. Uh, but mm. uh, they would have a, a jolly good go. Uh, uh, and of course, that has to be prepared. Yeah. So, um, uh, and in those days, this quite often was uh, running copiers off and, and doing it at 11 o'clock at night when you ran around the table putting the things together. Yeah, uh, I, I, again, it's a story about a yeah. project we can't talk about, but. but we had to do two bids on that. And the first bid, there was only seven people in the company cleared yeah. to understand the project. And we knocked that bid out complete, no mistakes. Mm. And we, we put in the odd seven o'clock, but nothing. But the next time we bid it, and it wasn't that much bigger bid, there was something like 30 people cleared and we had secretaries and everything. Yeah. And we were up to 11 o'clock, night yes. after night, and we were still late. Fortunately, we were the only bidder and they yeah. couldn't throw yeah. us out. But, um, I think it's an example that, that somehow there's this, this and they thing. They will always work right up to the deadline. No room for uh, yes, yes, yes. emergencies. Uh, even though it's absolutely critical that you get the thing yeah, right. on time. Um, on, on the MVSAT, I think ESA, ESA you know, was proud of it, sort of, it was getting vans of things. Yes, he took pictures and, and publicised the fact that he could handle all that much paperwork. But We know, I, I know when I was with Don Douglas and I heard the story on, on, on the American side, yeah. because the American space station, what became yeah. the ISS, was being bid at the same time. Um, there, the proposals arrived in heavy lorries, you know, 40 tonne lorries. Yeah. Um, so, and again, how anyone can process that sort Quite. of word, I, I, yeah. I never understood. But anyway, assuming that you have followed all the bidding rules, what do we do have to do to actually win the proposal? Well, it boils down to two things. First, we have to have the best technical solution, which normally means the cheapest that meets the specification. But the second thing is having that best technical solution alone is not enough. Uh, my company, one man, could probably produce a bid that would be the best technical solution. But you also have to prove that you have a credible organisation within which to do the work. And that doesn't mean you just have to show that you've got a big enough workforce. You have to present in detail the planning of how you're going to do all that work, which is outlined in the SAL, which brings us to management and the link between system engineering and management. What will be required as a starting point is something called a work breakdown. 
which is just what it sounds like. The task is successively broken down hierarchically. Indeed, we used a work breakdown as an example of a hierarchical network in the models video. We are treating the project as a system. That is, we're using the system model on the project itself, with the work activities within it being the functional elements. So work package breakdown is essentially another form of function breakdown, and we should follow the same rules that we outlined in our function analysis video. Typically, we should limit daughters to no more than seven at each step and keep each step on the same logical level. Although in real life, many who are creating these breakdowns do not appreciate that is what they're doing. They really are just doing a system functional analysis. So you will find a lot of sloppiness in real life examples. At the end of the process, the work should be split into work packages that are small enough for one person to monitor and control. Typically, this is around five to ten people and something like $100,000. With large projects costing billions and up to 10,000 people at any time working on it, then we're talking about thousands of work packages. But even small studies still use the technique, even if the study total is much smaller than a work package on a large project. On study contracts I have seen, I have seen work packages which are worth only 2,000 or even less. But these days, no customer is going to accept you can run a contract of any size without showing a work package breakdown and the subsequent descriptions and planning networks. Here is a fictitious example of a typical breakdown for the system design phase of a communication satellite. Like the system technical breakdown, the work package breakdown is the beginning of the creating of a management system. Just as no one engineer can grasp the totality of the system's technical complexity, so no one manager will be able to grasp the totality of the system's organisational complexity. Typically, you will find that there will be a lot of similarity between the system technical breakdown and the project management breakdown. The various skill sets of the personnel will align with the technical tasks, so this similarity is not surprising. There is an intimate relationship between the system management and the system engineering. Indeed, in smaller projects and at the lower level of larger projects, the engineering and the management is often being done by the same person. So some degree of matching between the two breakdowns is an obvious necessity to prevent confusion and schizophrenia. But they are not the same thing. And you should not just blindly copy the technical breakdown when creating a work package breakdown. The work breakdown on a full program, that is one that encompasses design, development and production, will need work done outside those activities scoped by the hardware elements, particularly all the system level activities and of course the management itself. You can see many of these in the 1000 series work packages dedicated to system level activities. The work package numbering that is shown in this made up example is typical of what you will find in the real thing, meaning that you can tell where a work package fits in the breakdown from its number. The level of complexity shown here, that is around 50 packages, would correspond to a large study or the design phase of a full development program and would be in the region of 100,000 to half a million pounds per package. In complete development production programs, each project phase would have separate breakdowns and the later phases would be more complex still. Now, there's three jobs that this breakdown process is designed to perform. Firstly, it is to ensure that the interface between the different work elements are all covered and well defined. That is, the work done by one person really is what is required by the next person in line. The second job is to enable detailed and accurate costing of the project, or, or should I say rather the next step of the project. As we've outlined, in the early stages you're likely to get better estimates by using cost estimating relationships. But as you actually enter into doing the job, the management team need agreed prices with everyone involved, and also the detail on where the costs are within the project and what the spend profile will be. And again, all this requires a bottom-up costing uh, approach. The third job 
is to enable the progress of the project to be monitored once it has started. The work package analysis gives a detailed prediction of work done and the money spent as time progresses, which can then be tracked once the project is actually underway to give early warning of any cost or schedule problems. You said something very important back there, that work package breakdowns are the application of the system model to the management of large projects. And therefore, each work package should be seen as a black box function. Uh, this is a point that many do not uh, uh, grasp while using the project planning tools uh, and, uh, and is often seen an area where I've seen people get in a tangle. Each work package is connected to other work packages in the project, or if not, to the, uh, then to the starting, the kickoff point uh, of the project, or uh, to the eventual de deliverables of the project as, they, as a whole. Absolutely. And if we go back to the function video, we know if they are functions, then we should be looking for outputs, transformations and inputs. But we cannot get these from the breakdown alone. No, the inputs, transformations and outputs are covered in something that goes with every work package, uh, which is its description. So let's see how those work. This is a work package breakdown for a small study that was proposed by guest associates for a system to collect dead satellites in geostationary orbit. It included contributions from myself and Mark. And for each work package here, there's a corresponding description. So let's look at one of these. This is a description that goes with work package 2.6. There are many different versions of this template, but this one is based on the European Space Agency form, which is typical of the European space industry. At the head is just the information telling the project and which work package this relates to, but also the organisation and most importantly, the person who is going to be responsible for it. The header also includes timing information. The start and end events are things that are going to be determined by the overall plan. The duration is how long the job is expected to take, which is determined by the work package. If the expected duration is more than the time between the start and end dates, you have a problem. But properly, they will be determined by the delivery date from the input work packages and the requirements for succeeding work packages for the delivery of the appropriate outputs. When the work package description is first drafted, you probably don't know the start and end dates. The work package description tends to get revised during the project planning and the dates will be set by the project plan as a whole and can be added to the later issues. The description itself starts with an outline of the objectives. This is a modern innovation and not always included. It was found that to have an objective statement can help focus on what the function should be and also provide something to use for validation. Then we have the inputs required to do the task. These should identify where those inputs are coming from. And now we're getting to the function part of the work package. So then we have the tasks to be undertaken on those inputs. This is an area where there is a difference of opinion. Mark, who wrote this one, prefers short but precise descriptions. But others, especially customers, often want more expansion of the task and how they will be performed. The tasks produce outputs, and these are listed in the next box. And this completes the definition of the work package as a function. Generally, a work package description will end with the output box. In this case, some additional boxes have been added, recording the assumptions for the input to the bottom of the uh, costing of the study. Mark, although this form was used by guest associates, it actually originates from you and your company. So can you explain why there's a cost section in your form? Uh, in the past, when planning for studies in other companies, I found that having the costing information separated from the work package description was at best an inconvenience and could actually cause problems. Particularly because, as you've already pointed out, as the project planning 
progresses, these work packages are continually being revised. And I found that coordinating the costing information with the latest variation of the work package description difficult. And this is a way I found that the work package information is all in one place with the cost estimate and the description, which always match because they've been done together. Now, the reason this is not normally done is because customers also want to have sight of the work package descriptions, either in the proposal or at least when you start with the kickoff meeting. And the costing information at the base there is clearly sensitive. So when that time arrives, when it's time to show the customer the work packages, I just chop off the cost boxes. Another point I would make is that your test descriptions are quite short. Yes, uh, I, again to tell a story on that, when I was preparing the work packages for the Sabre Engine Development Programme, which was being done in conjunction with the European Space Agency, so they were seeing what we were doing, there was a tension between us. My view has always been that the task should be listed and defined, properly defined, but without elaboration. And the Space Agency view was that in addition to just saying what the task is, you should explain how you're going to do it and what software you're going to use and all this sort of detail. They felt that way we would have a better understanding of what we were getting into. Now, I felt that this sort of detail was unnecessary at, this, at that stage. And working it out was just adding to the cost and the time in the project planning, which is a real issue for a small company like Reaction Engines. Now the truth of the matter lies that the best thing is actually probably somewhere in the middle between yeah. the two. There's a danger when looking at a single example it, it is that work package descriptions are seen as a self-contained job description for the work package manager or for the team where they start work so that where they start work when a set of inputs is available and produce various outputs at the end acti uh, of the activity or as undefined pos positions within it. Where different outputs occur at different points within the work package activity, this really means that we've clustered several work packages together uh, for convenience uh, because the same manager and the same team are going to be responsible for it. But this can lead uh, to um, issues when planning the project as a whole uh, because you're connected to uh, uh, points within the uh, work package uh, rather than simply to the end of the work package itself. Yes, I would have to reinforce that with my personal experience is that you should, even if you find you've got more work packages than you might have desired, uh, if, if that's what the logic of the network you're creating says, that's the way you should do yes. it. Yeah. The work packages are elements of the management system and we should perhaps look and how we integrate them together at this point. We have seen in the work package description both the inputs and outputs are defined, but it also identifies where they come from and go to uh, in linking to other work packages. We can use the work package as nodes and the inputs and outputs as the links, creating a network looking like this. This network just shows the study logic and for this little study, it does not tell us very much. But if we add the durations of each package, then we have a length value for each path. And then we can find the longest path through the network, uh, which will be the minimum time it will take to do all the activity. And everything on that path will be critical to achieving that time. These networks are called critical path networks. Let us look at an artificial example. Let us imagine that we are giving a dinner party and we have an infinite number of servants. And that's a key point about critical path analysis. It works for a big organisation that can pull people on and off the project as the workload requires. Small projects in small organisations are more constrained by who is available and the work that has to be distributed among the staff available. Then work packages have to be staggered so the team can cope and that's what determines the time required for the project. But in this case, we can track the critical path. We can see that we need to pay attention uh, to cooking the main course stew and to assuring that things keep to time. 
Once the main course is being eaten, the pressure is off on the staff until the guests finish and then the critical path returns to staff activity of clearing the table and washing up. But this is a simple example of a critical path uh, that fits on one slide. And of course, it would not in reality be used for something as simple as this. It will be used on large projects where the work package breakdowns and critical path networks uh, used to be on many sheets of A0 paper. Although these days we would substitute a computer screen. But even back in the 1960s, the critical path analysis would always be done on a computer. The network is a matrix uh, which can be solved to find the critical path. And of course, once the project is started, the network can be used to monitor progress. Well, Bob, I understand you had some early experience of a CPN controlled project. Yes, uh, this was back in the 1970s when I was in charge of design of solid motors at Westcott. Uh, and we had a new project uh, that was being run from elsewhere, uh, of which we were a subcontractor. Um, in a, and um, it was felt that this ought to be uh, done properly and professionally these days. And so there was a, um, a, a CPM uh, thing at, at the prime uh, contractor. Uh, and we basically had two, package, uh, two packages. We had a small package right at the beginning and I can't even remember what it was for now, but it was a specialist package where they wanted some information up front so they could do everything. And then sometime later, <coughs> we had a bigger package or a, probably a series of packages, which were basically delivering test motors uh, downstream. Um, and it had all the uh, uh, information was put into their system. And um, as it happened, the... Um, the, the, the week this project started, the specialist we needed for the first package was available. Uh, so we asked him to do it and he did it. And, and a few days later, it was all signed off and we, we'd done our first package, you see. And then I went to the first monthly meeting and was immediately set upon by the uh, project manager or the CPM uh, guy saying, why are you so vastly overspent on this project? <laughs> Uh, and, and I said, no, hang on a minute. I've not even been able to collect a full team together yet. Um, we can't be overspent. And it turned out that the, the system uh, had worked, that they give that this little package at the beginning, mm. it could be anywhere in the first couple of months. And the fact we'd done it within the first week meant that the computer assumed we were going to spend money at that rate for the next eight weeks. And it assumed that everything else, we were going to spend all the money. So it looked as though we had a horrendous um, overspend. We'd done our work and we were precisely on time. Uh, it took a little while to find that out. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's, it's the danger of getting a new tool and not mm. understanding the new yes. tool. And I really don't think you should be projecting costs forward on a CPN network. No. As Bob's story shows, there can be problems using this as a project control method for the inexperienced. But even when used expertly, once you have found a problem, it does not really help you get out of it. This issue was understood very early in the use of critical paths, and when the US Navy was about to tackle the Polaris program, which had the objective of launching nuclear missiles underwater from a submarine, it was judged to be the most ambitious engineering venture ever undertaken and would need new project management control techniques. So the Navy and the prime contractor Lockheed expanded the idea of critical path analysis to a process they called Program Evaluation and Review Technique, or PERT for short. The key difference is that for each work package, there is not just an estimate for its duration, there are three time estimates. Firstly, a most likely time. Now, this is the one that corresponds to the duration in a simple critical path analysis. But then there's an optimistic time, which is the best time it could take if everything goes well and there's no resource constraints. And then there is a pessimistic time, which is the worst time required, assuming everything reasonable can, that goes wrong has gone wrong. 
Once we have these values in the network, we can make a determination of the uncertainty in the critical path, and hence an estimate of the uncertainty in the project delivery date. But we can also do more than that. We can analyse the matrix to not only find the main critical path, but other paths which could be at risk of becoming the critical path, which can help concentrate management attention more broadly on risk areas given real-world uncertainties. But most important value of PERT is that it gives management a tool to plan when something does go wrong, because if the schedule slips, it enables informed decisions as to where best to put effort to recover the schedule. Let us say in this example that the preparation of the stew slips by a full 10 minutes. That's the worst estimate and now we are 10 minutes late. But if we look at our PERT network, we can see that if we put more effort into clearing the table and washing up, then we might be able to recover those 10 minutes. So with PERT, these networks can not only give management an early warning of where the trouble lies, but also provide a tool to plan for the resolution. It is common to confuse simple critical path analysis and the more sophisticated PERT. But now we have explained it to you, I'm sure none of you will ever confuse the two, or the bogeyman will get you. However, when you look at the instructions for proposal from a potential customer, they almost never ask for critical path networks. The main use of critical path networks is in planning the time required to complete the study, and as we have seen, they do not account for constraints due to the size and actual skill set of the team. But the main reason they do not interest the customer is they are a poor way to keep track of a project once it has started, because they have no lock into the calendar. Say, for example, it's the first week in January and you want to know what work packages should be running. It's just not possible to see that on a work package network. So what the customer asks for is a Gantt or milestone chart invented by this man, Henry Gantt. If we take this study network, we've already seen that we can establish how long we need between the various milestone reviews through the critical path analysis. And this starts to give us a calendar which we can then fit the various other work packages in on, on the timescale it creates. This is where you may have to stretch time to account for the fact that the same team have to do more than one work package on that network, which are shown in parallel, but of course then in practice could not be done at the same time. What a Gantt chart does is lay out the work packages as horizontal bars along a calendar axis, so now it's very easy to find the date, then look up to see which of the work packages should be active a quick and easy way to see if a project is on schedule. So customers like these. It's a sort of sword of Damocles they can hold over the contractor. But it works both ways. Note the milestone payments at the bottom. For planning, once I have a Gantt chart, I put it into a spreadsheet with work package costs spread over the duration. And sometimes I also put the personnel requirements in. And this gives me a project spend profile and a workforce profile over the project's duration. The weak part of the traditional Gantt chart is that they lose the links between the work packages. So another thing that I used for projects that I was managing was to mix the critical path with the Gantt to produce something that looked like this. It helped me create the traditional Gantt chart for the customer and also for my own use I found it more effective as a planning tool than the completely time independent critical path network. A comment I have often got from customers when seeing my critical path networks and my Gantt charts that you're seeing in this lecture is what software am I using to get such clear diagrams and are rather surprised when I say PowerPoint because they are assuming I'm using one of the many software packages available that mix Gantt and work package networks to produce project planning and monitoring platforms. This is an example of a modern computer-based project management software output. Basically, it is a computer-controlled Gantt chart, but note they do have the connections between work packages. But most of these uh, computer software offerings do not enable critical path analysis, which I find rather strange. 
While you can use this Gantt chart interface after a bit of practice, you can see that it is not a very good illustration for use in a project proposal, which is why I draw my Gantt charts in PowerPoint. After all, the main purpose of the chart, particularly in the proposal, is illustration and explanation, and a human produced chart is far more likely to achieve that goal. There are several project management software packages available, all appropriately expensive. On sm small scale study projects that I have managed, I don't think they really hold any value over simple spreadsheets. But whatever you're dealing with, you must have a defined process to manage the project through work packages, even if you're going to manage them by hand. With studies, we normally have a small team, often a group of equals, with one who volunteers to act as the nominal manager to keep track of things and write the project progress reports. But with larger development and production projects, we need a more defined hierarchical architecture. Generally, aerospace industry employs one of two basic forms of project management structure called project organisation and matrix organisation. So let's just start by looking at project organization. Project organization is where a team with the required skills is put together either from the wider personnel pool within a company or if it's a single product company by recruitment. This team is normally co-located and is managed through a simple hierarchy. Each project has a project manager who is responsible for both the schedule, the cost and the technical content and the project team members have only one manager and work within a multidisciplinary environment. This seems very logical and be, can be a very creative environment, but in the context of larger companies it has a few downsides. Firstly, the project team only lasts as long as the project, leading to constant reorganisation. Secondly, company skills and workloading is, is more difficult to spread among projects as you can only deal in units of one person. So the power engineer on one project can be underloaded, spending his time looking at the ceiling, while the project next door, the power engineer is overworked and not coping. And thirdly, the balancing of cost and schedule against quality and standards relies on the individual judgment of the project manager. And often the pressures of cost and schedule can win out. These issues led the larger aeronautical companies in the 1950s to adopt a more complex management structure called matrix management. Named such because it's a matrix formed by the separate project and line management structures. This approach organises the workforce along the same technical divisions as the system that is being developed, the product of the company. The workforce are placed in specialist engineering departments, sometimes called line departments. So all the structure engineers form one group, the power engineers form another group, and, and so on. These line departments then allocate these specialist engineers to the various projects the company is undertaking. Now, each project has their own management, but the engineering workforce comes from the line departments. Thus, every engineer has two management structures over him or her. It has the line or department which is responsible for the engineering and for the overall deployment of the workforce and project which is responsible for the system engineering and the task allocations within the project. With matrix organisation, engineers and other bookable personnel can easily be split between projects. And if two projects only need a half-time specialist for their tasks, then one person can be split can split their time between them and do the job for both of them. Matrix management is the most widely used management organisation in a large aerospace company, but it's not perfect. Firstly, of course, it only works for large organisations that have many projects. It can lead to tensions between the engineering department, which is concerned with the engineering quality, and the project management, which is concerned with the schedule and cost. This tension is actually a problem regardless of the management structure, and whichever structure is employed will need to have a methodology to deal with it. The project, in project management, the team is generally co-located, and this helps develop a team spirit that focuses on achieving that project's goals. 
In matrix organisations, the people working on a project are often actually co-located with their fellow specialists and rather divorced in what is going on in the project as a whole. And this can generate a sort of lack of enthusiasm or drive to achieve the job. Also, this can be a higher cost way of working, probably a result of some of these other problems. But it also reflects that it tends to do a more thorough engineering job at the end of the day. These two structures are typical of what you will find with large companies tending to matrix management and smaller companies tending to project management. In both cases, the structure, at least for the technical engineering staff, roughly follows the technical breakdown of the system they're managing. We should point out that there are, are many other ways to characterise management structures. For example, you can find a distinction between hierarchical structures where the rule of five is maintained, that is a manager has no more than five areas of responsibility, and flat management where this rule is not considered to keep the organisation simple and minimise management overhead. They point, the point being to match the management organisation with scale and nature of the activities that are being managed. Exactly. So let's look at an example of that with the Lockheed Skunk Works. In 1943, Lockheed founded the Advanced Development Project Group under an engineer named Clarence Kelly Johnson to develop the Shooting Star Fighter, America's first jet fighter. It became known as the Skunk Works, a joke name from a popular cartoon at the time. It has been responsible for some spectacular aircraft, such as the F-104 Starfighter, the U-2, the SR-71 Blackbird, and the F-117 Stealth Bomber. But it's also produced some turkeys, but, well, people tend to forget about them. It's not only produced these spectacular aircraft, it brings it in at something like half the cost. Well, that's what Lockheed say, there's argument about it, but it's certainly substantially cheaper than you'd expect from a traditional aerospace organisation. So not surprisingly, the group is much admired and imitators often refer to skunk working. Well, at least they used to do until Lockheed made it a trademark. Basically, it uses a project organisation structure but operates under special rules. And during the 1950s, Kelly Johnson outlined the 14 rules that he felt made skunk work management style successful. Some of these reflect the 1950s. These days with computers, we'd expect weekly cost returns regardless of the management style. Some of the rules are things that are simply good practice, including the one that we stressed earlier, which is do not alter specifications once they are frozen. Some of these rules stress that this is an extreme form of project management. Note that these make the project manager, i.e. Mr Johnson, a complete dictator, not only of the technical aspects, but also the employee's career advancement. But this control also emphasised in the unusual constraints on the customer's involvement, placing a real emphasis on Rule 12 about trust, which really means trust by the customer in the contractor rather than the other way around. Kelly would only allow one customer representative in the plant and he wasn't allowed to have a desk. Now, the way that Skunk Works operates today has softened many of these rules as with its Boeing counterpart, the Phantom Works. But this remains a project-based management approach nestling in a larger matrix organisation. Um, as the skunk work sort of became known, the UK was often a little cool about it, mostly because at that time the British industry consisted of small companies with small company structures, which meant effectively many were using this sort of project management technique anyway, which raises the overall question of if Lockheed have been so successful with it, why doesn't everybody do it? Well, for a start, it splits the company resource base. The Skunk Works took the finest engineers the company had, leaving only the mediocre in the other company divisions. I once worked on a Lockheed-led project, and it definitely seemed to me that I was working with whatever the opposite of a Skunk Works was.
It means you have removed the most talented from the management matrix so they cannot be deployed on other day-to-day -day projects. The Skunkworks techniques only really work for demonstrators, prototypes and small production runs, ideally less than 50 and certainly less than 100. The Skunk Works project that was produced in thousands, that is the F-104 Starfighter, had issues that it could be argued a more conventionally developed aircraft might have avoided. You see, large production volume aircraft need to be optimised to meet multitudes of roles and need much larger teams and more focused complex management structures to achieve its goals. Skunk Works best when it is focused on a single role system where it does not have to be fully optimised in every area to succeed. The small team produces variable quality output and yes this does give the freedom to produce the genius but it also has the freedom to produce a turkey. Although on balance over several projects the customer probably does gain more successes than failures. Now, if a turkey has been produced and the project is government funded, the political fallout can be a problem. A lot of the micromanagement by politicians and civil servants of government projects is to protect against embarrassment rather than actually increase the chances of success. In this context, it helped that all of the skunk work projects are in the black, that is the secret world, so goofs and problems tend not to be made public. Now, small teams working in semi-secrecy with a trust between the paymaster who does not get to see much of what's going on were all important factors to the skunk work's early success. But this is not always realistic in the real world. I think the famous achievements of the skunk work sometimes blind people to the fact that it does have its limitations. Indeed, even Lockheed do not use it for every aircraft they produce. Oh, quite. Um, I, I, it, it has a number of, of advantages which you can only use in particular cases. Uh, one of the advantages was it was very isolate, uh, very insulated from the customer making repeated demands. So that's worth quite a bit uh, in terms of difficulty. Uh, it had clear objectives uh, that were straightforward didn't have to do 57 jobs at the same time. Yeah, so the requirement specifications that they accepted really only ever had a single goal, which they met. And That's right. They weren't making flexible yes. general multiple-purpose yeah. aircraft. And they, and they had, frankly, a, a very good team that was able to move quickly because it was small, mm. uh, but it was backed up uh, by a large organisation that had the resources and funds to make to, to make it happen. So you almost have the best of both worlds there, which is the small company flexibility y yes. with the large company financial support and security. That's right. And even then, it didn't always get things right. No, I think about half their projects you don't talk about. <coughs> and we perhaps also should mention that... Um, they, they, certainly in the early days, they were very vulnerable to the fact that, that it was one guy, Kelly Johnson. Yes. And if they took him away, that probably would not have worked. Yes, I think that, that having the right guy, and in fact it happened twice, because Ben Rich, who succeeded Kelly Johnson, was able to do the same sort of things uh, with his, uh, as an apprentice to, uh, to Johnson early. But, but that, that doesn't always work. I mean, Korolev... Um, within the Soviet system yeah. was running uh, and it was all down to him and as soon as his deputy, Michin, who shadowed him for decades yes. or so, came in, the, the thing fell apart. Yes, because he didn't have the genius bit. Mm. So, um, I think this Skunk Works example um, gives us a lesson for about having the appropriate project management structure for the task in hand and that sort of rule applies to all system engineering techniques uh, that we've shown over the course. Indeed even whether you use systems engineering depends on the complexity of what's being engineered. But as things progress things that were previously simple are becoming complex in part due to the impact of information technology uh, and the greater impact of the scale of human activity is having on the environment. But what we've given you here is a, 
a collection of tools which are useful for system engineering that you can use when you've got the appropriate environment to use them in uh, and use and you don't have to use them every time any more than you'd use a spanner to unscrew a screw um, use them and have fun with it so we hope our introduction to the subject will give you a foundation when you come to use systems engineering in your future career Well, there was one thing I was wondering. Should we have given a dictionary definition of a washing machine? <laughs>